This is Josiah Plays Kingdom Death Monster on Tabletop Simulator. I'm starting a brand new campaign here, and from the beginning, starting fresh, and for this I have added the following expansions. I have added the Gorm, I have added the Lonely Tree, I have added the Flower Knight, and the Dung Beetle Knight. Along with all of the gear and events and everything that goes along with those expansions. I'm also going to be playing with this variant campaign rule. Now, normally, you play the People of the Lantern. And there are two big expansions for the game that give you different campaigns where you can play the People of the Stars or the People of the Sun with whole different rules and stuff. But this is a variant off of the People of the Lantern version called People of the Skull. And this is what we're going to be playing, which I think is going to make the game more challenging if I'm unlucky or easier if I'm really lucky. But it, it, it changes the base rules a little bit. The People of the Skull worship skulls above all else. Survivors can only place weapons and armor with the bone keyword in their gear grid. What that means is, at least 60-70% of the weapons in the game I won't be able to use, and like 95% of the armor in the game I won't be able to use. And I won't be able to complete any armor sets and get the bonuses from them, because there's no set that has a whole set of armor with bone in it that I'm aware of from what I've looked at. But, they ignore the frail rule, which is kind of cool because a lot of bone weapons say that they're frail, which means if you hit a super dense location with that weapon, it breaks, it's destroyed. But, the people of the skull, their shit is not frail, so I don't have to worry about that. When I name a survivor, I start with four survivors right now who are blank slates and have no names. When I name a survivor, if they have the word bone or skull in their name, in addition to plus one survival, Players can choose to gain plus one permanent accuracy, evasion, strength, luck, or speed. So, I do need to name my survivors, and I am going to name them all something with bone or skull so we can get that bonus. And then during the develop step of the settlement phase, the survivors can use the Skull Ritual Special Endeavor, in which we perform an exotic violent dance with plenty of chanting. We consume a skull. We have to find an actual skull, and then we consume it. And up to four people get a permanent bonus to all their attributes. Now that's the luck element. A skull is the rarest common resource you can find. You're not guaranteed to ever find skulls. But you could. And so, if I happen to find a lot of skulls by pure luck, my characters will get very powerful. If I happen to not find any skulls, my characters will be a lot weaker than normal. So it could really go either way. Um, so that's the one we're using, People of the Skull. Beyond that, it is time to begin the story of the adventure. <clears throat> so here we go. Monster is a game about surviving in the darkness. You lose if your settlement's population reaches zero. You win when your settlement defeats the Watcher. And it is a campaign where you play with the same characters or the same settlement from game session to game session. Each game session is a complete cycle of three phases. Hunt phase, showdown phase, settlement phase. And here is the prologue of the game. This is what the game is about. And it's very mysterious. This doesn't tell you much about its setting or story. It just gives you vague ideas and you have to fill in the rest in your head, kind of. <clears throat> so here's our four initial survivors laying on a, a field of stone faces. Once upon a time, there was a place of carved stone faces. A man with a lantern lay sleeping a dreamless sleep. The man knew nothing. Here he is waking up. One day the man woke up. He rubbed the dried ink caked over his eyes and opened them. Around him he saw other people stirring, and beyond, a horizon of unbroken darkness. Some of the survivors are meeting one another, apparently. They've got the ink on their faces. 
It's never explained why they have ink on their faces. A woman approached the man with the lantern. Her soft hand reached out to him. They had no words. They were a mystery to each other. And then they see this motherfucker. He looks serious. Suddenly, a monster emerged from the darkness, its eyes wild with hunger. It attacked. And it looks like it's winning. A little bit. It disarmed one guy. The people were no match for the monster. It tore their flesh and crushed their bones between its teeth. Some it devoured whole. There he is, crawling toward the lantern as the lion looks above with his glowing red eyes, ready to leap. Literally disarmed, that's right, Knox. Overcome with terror and grief, the man with the lantern collapsed to the ground. Cold stone noses pushed into his side. There was no escape. But then he finds a cracked piece of the faces. What does this mean? But the man did not want to die. Desperately grasping at the cold stone faces, he felt a crack and tore at it with all his might. A piece of stone came free. It was sharp and deadly. And now he's pissed. He's going berserk. The man with the lantern scrambled to his feet, his weapon clenched in his fist. He took a deep breath and roared into the darkness. And here are the initial four survivors, ready to rock. They look pretty badass. This is another picture of the characters. Oh, I, I don't have it over here. Well, there's another picture. We'll get to it at some point. There they are. Ready to kick ass. Or die, more likely. Somewhere in the place of stone faces, nameless men stand together. And women. They have nothing but a need to survive and a lantern to light their struggle. And now we start the first story. This is the prologue of the game. It picks up after the awakening of the survivors. Before they can talk, take stock of their surroundings, they must fight for their lives against a vicious white lion. So we are about to get wrecked. Alright, so now we need to create our survivors. Everybody gets a founding stone, which is the piece of rock they picked up off the off of the faces, which can be used to stab as a pretty terrible melee weapon, or you can throw it and it's expended forever, but it delivers an automatic critical hit, which is pretty nice. And they just simply have a piece of cloth wrapped around their waist. Now my ruling on this is that their people of the skull limitation on only being able to use bone stuff does not begin until they have an actual settlement. Once they found their settlement, that, that restriction will come into, into play. But for the prologue fight, they can use this stuff that they start with before they learn the mysteries and secrets of bone and cast off these feeble cloths forever and presumably run around naked after that. So, we've got to all we really have to do with our survival survivors in the first place is name them, give them a point of survival, and add one to one of their attributes because we have bone or skull in the name. <coughs> It's a stone face, so it is skull-ish. Yes, but it's not made of bone, it's made of stone. And then we're gonna fight the white lion, who is right here. He's a vicious looking dude. Here's our four characters. And as I did in my old campaign, the red one is going to be the leader. Of course. <clears throat> I had I had this picture pulled out because I like this picture a lot. I 
and blown up over here so that I could like see what my characters look like. There. There's there's my characters. So, um we have to name them now. Everybody starts with one survival, which is an extremely important resource that you need to survive and win, basically. And one is not very many of them. Right now, all we can do with it is dodge. We can't use these other actions with survival because we haven't learned how yet. So, my leader... ...needs a name. I think she's gonna be... Blaze Skull? Blaze Skull? Blood Skull? I guess she's gonna be Blood Skull. It's a lovely name. <laughs> Blast Femur. <laughs> then we come over here. And that's her, right there. Then we come over here to this guy. He's male. And he is going to be called... He is going to be called... Man, it's suddenly hard coming up with names that I like that are thematic to the colors and have either bone or skull in them. I think I'm going to choose a naming convention where all of my male characters have bone and all of my female characters have skull. Just because. Naming conventions make things easier. His name is going to be Bone Grinder. And then we have my green guy, the man with the lantern. His name is going to be Name is going to be Bone Grinder and Bone Strider sound too similar, though. Bone Tree. 
Bone Tree. Why? Why not? It's a weird fucking name is what it is. And then, and that's him. He's the guy with the lantern. Well, they all have lanterns, actually. But he's the guy that looks like the guy with the lantern from the starting story. And then we're going to go with... Um, Bone Marrow. <laughs> and then we're going to go with our last character. And she's female, and that's her right there. Right. She's going to be... Ghost Skull. Alright, we got Ghost Skull, Bone Tree, Bone Grinder, and Blood Skull. I may rename Bone Tree if I think of something I like better than Bone Tree, because I'm not thrilled about Bone Tree. I think I like the other three names fine. Bone Tree is probably the one that will die first, because in my last game, the fucking green guy died first, so it might be irrelevant. Alright, here we are. We've just woken up. We need to set up our first showdown now. Looking for a showdown. First story, White Lion. Now, this is a weaker White Lion than the normal level 1 White Lion that you'll hunt. It only has a toughness of six, and it has it has fewer AI cards. In fact, you have to sp normally you randomly draw cards to create its AI deck, but in this case, for the first story, it tells you to pick certain ones, presumably to make it a little bit less difficult. Chaw, chomp, size up, power swat, and grasp. We need those. Size up, chomp. Claw, power swat, and grasp. Claw, grasp, power swat. So those are going to be its basic cards. Although I'm surprised for this tutorial that they put Enraged in there, because Enraged is a motherfucker. You don't like Enraged when that happens. So, Maul, and Maul isn't your happy time either. Maul, Terrifying Roar, and Enraged. And actually, even Terrifying Roar, when you don't have any insanity to protect your brain, Terrifying Roar can be scary town too. So see, what you hope happens, is you hope that you wounded the creature and take some of those more dangerous AI cards out of its deck before it has a chance to use them. If you get lucky, that's what happens. If you get unlucky... Oh. Here's a prologue AI deck right here. With all the cards that I just picked out. Except for Claw, which it uses, it automatically uses Claw in the first turn. Well, shit. Now I've got to separate these back out and add them back to their fucking decks. Guess I didn't notice that I already had that set up. So here's the prologue deck. Now you automatically use Claw, because it tells you right here. Set Claw aside, shuffle the remaining cards, place Claw on the top of the AI deck. Okay. And then... You take its hit location deck, and you it always starts with a certain location. With its, for its first location. And it's the strange hand. So, you shuffle all this, and you put the strange hand on there. 
So you know what the first hit location is going to be. That's very important. In a moment, I'll, I'll show you why. And it's basic action card, which shows... See, the, the first story one is the one at the very top there, and it only has move 6, toughness 6. Man, I remember when toughness 6 seemed like a lot to me. Now, anything under toughness like 12, and I'm like, lol. <laughs> On my other campaign, I mean. I mean, in this game, toughness 6 would be plenty hard. Alright, uh, and then we just... Each player has to place their survivor anywhere six squares away from the white lion, and you can't count diagonally. And then you have the showdown, which I already know quite well how to do that. So I think they're all exactly six squares away right now. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Five. Yeah, they're all six squares away, but I don't. Which means they're equis, equidistant to the lion. And I guess this is how I'm going to have them. Now, the lion goes first. I'm pretty sure there's no special rule here. Yeah, the lion goes first. And we have, like, nothing to protect us. No special abilities. No gear to speak of. No special bonus. Oh, we do get special bonuses to our stats, though. Because... We named ourselves with Skull and Bone in our names. Each of us gets to choose one stat to get a permanent plus one to. Ooh, it's a tough choice. Speed is really, really good, but so is Evasion. You know what, I think I'll give each of them a different one, just to, like, set them apart as, like, having a personality. On tree. Do I like tree? I want something kind of planty. I guess we'll stick with tree. He's gonna have evasion. Cause I'm gonna try to set up bone tree to be my bone bark. <laughs> I'm gonna try to set him up to be like my tank. Um. I think Ghost Skull is going to go Luck. She's going to be my crit. My critical hitter. And I think I'll go with... Speed for Blood Skull. And... Man, it's hard to pick strength because speed is such a better stat. Like, it's so much rarer to get speed bonuses than to get strength bonuses. But I'm going to keep it thematic. I'm going to pick strength. She's the fast one. He's the strong one. He's the evasive one. And she's the lucky one. Alright. So... It's the lion's turn. First thing we do is draw a card for him, and his card is Claw, as we knew it would be. He picks the closest threat facing in range. That is all four of them. They are tied, which means we just get to decide who he goes after. So we're going to decide... ...that he goes after Bone Tree. And... Now he attacks. He has no special tokens. There's the priority target. We'll put it right here. And I'm going to take one of these. Flip it around. And make it the token that indicates who last wounded the monster. He gets two attacks. He needs to roll threes to hit because... Wait, we don't set up any terrain for this? Nope, I guess the first showdown has no terrain. Alright. Of course it goes after the green one. Of course it does. Um, so he gets to roll two dice, and he has to roll three or higher to hit. 
He did miss with one nicely, so he only hit once. So we roll a hit location die to see where he hit Bone Tree. He hit him in the body. Now, fortunately, he's only doing one damage right now, which is a light wound to the body. We could spend our one survival to dodge that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to save that dodge for when he really needs it. And that is the lion's turn. So now it's our turn. <coughs> so here's what's going to happen. Blood Skull, our leader, is immediately going to throw her founding stone. Delivers an automatic critical hit. So she, this simply gets deleted. It's gone. She no longer has it. But we happen to know that the first hit location is the Strange Hand. And if you get a critical hit on the Strange Hand, you hack off the monster's hand. Spend one survival to treasure this moment and gain plus one permanent strength. So because she did that, her strength goes up. Forever. And we did a wound to the monster. So well worth it. Just gonna throw that. And minus one survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right. Good call. Um so that's beautiful. So basically when you start this game, it's always worth it to use a founding stone on the very first turn because you're gonna get that plus one strength. If you happen to know that ahead of time, which you know you're going to after you've played the game at least once all right so we'll do uh how let's see can they get there one two three four five one two they can't get to the blind spot but they can get in on the creatures so here comes bone grinder and he's gonna try You know, I think he's going to also throw a Founding Stone. We're not going to be able to use these Founding Stones after this fight, because they're not bone items, and we're going to have to abandon them. So we're just going to throw all the Founding Stones. Fuck it, we're going to make this fight easier on ourselves. <coughs> so another crit to the Beast Scapular Deltoid. The trauma of the impact fractures the White Lion's shoulder. It gains a minus one movement token. So for the rest of the fight, its movement speed is reduced. And another wound is dealt. Um, Bone Tree is going to lob his Founding Stone too. Why not? I mean, we're going to be fighting with Fist and Tooth for the rest of this battle, but... We're delivering, what, four automatic critical wounds. Is he still moving up to the lion? Well, he's already right in front of the lion. He's right here. I still want to keep him close to the lion. Oh, you mean is he still moving up to the lion? Yeah, I want him in position to, get cl to be able to melee effectively next time. Assuming the lion doesn't run off all over Hell's Half Acre, which is definitely a possibility. <coughs> Um, anyway, we use the Founding Stone. I like to flip these over so I know who's gone. We get another automatic crit against the Beast Brow. The White Lion's vision is impaired. The White Lion gains minus one accuracy token. That's fantastic. It definitely makes this fight a lot easier if you just use all the Founding Stones right away. But that's not really a good idea in a regular campaign, because you're really going to want them later on, on much harder fights than this, probably. Um, and then Ghost Skull will move up. Up next to, and also lob a Founding Stone directly into the line. Now, if we draw a trap card, the Founding Stone is just wasted. But we hit him in the back. Critical wound, he gains another minus one accuracy token. Okay, this is going to make the fight considerably easier. Because now that he's going to have to roll two higher to hit us every time. 
And that's all we can do, because we don't have any surge or dash or extra actions or any bullshit with these characters yet, so... All they can do is their one little thing. That makes it the lion's turn again. The lion is going to size up. Random threat in field of view. Alright, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Random threat is going to be bone tree. Intimidate the target. Now, when you have zero insanity, this shit is scary. The monster stares down its prey. Turn to face target and roll 1d10. A four. Four better. The target suffers one brain damage and is knocked down. So we're going to flip him down. And he's going to take... He's got one health box in his brain. If he takes any more brain damage, he automatically has to roll on the brain trauma table. Which sucks. And you can't dodge these, like, intimidate attacks. Fortunately, the lion is now finished. So let's start wailing on a motherfucker. Honestly, doesn't matter who goes in what order, because they all have the exact same capabilities right now. Oh, he's not even going to get to go. He doesn't get to stand up until the end of the lion's next turn. Now, <laughs> if we had the encourage action unlocked, which is a survival action which we don't have right now, if we had it, we could use it, a point of survival, to get him up so he could have his turn. But we don't have it. So he's just going to be stuck and lose his turn this time. One, two... He's going to move around behind. Bone Grinder, going for it. Now, let's see. His chance to hit is going to be in the shitter. Because you need an 8-plus with Fist and Tooth. You need an 8-plus, and he has no bonus to accuracy. But he does get a plus 1 because he's in the blind spot, so he has to roll a 7. And he gets 2 dice because speed of Fist and Tooth is 2. Oh! 2 hits! Nice! What do we got? We got the beast ribs. We got the beast flank. Oh, you could knock him down with a crit. Or you could weaken him. Alright, I'm going to try the beast ribs first. Now, to wound, he's got one point of strength. His weapon has zero strength. <clears throat> so that means... The creature has a toughness of six, though. That means he needs to roll a five or better to wound. I rolled the wrong die, but it doesn't matter. Great, we got a wound. On the uh, beast ribs. Take one of these, put it over there. Nothing else special. Special happens because the attacker does not have three plus understanding. Now to try to wound the beast's flank. Exactly what he needed. Cats hate this. The monster is very upset. Attacker gains the priority target token. So that means Bone Grinder is definitely getting attacked this next time. He's also the last one to wound. Although I don't think this thing has revenge in its deck, so that's not going to come in. That's not going to matter, but... <coughs> Did I? Dude, we're tearing through this thing. Four more hits and it's dead. Of course, we did just use four Founding Stones, so we kind of just, like, went Nova on a motherfucker. Cool. He's done. Let's do, uh, let's do Ghost Skull next. Ghost Skull's gonna move into the, into the, into the, uh, blind spot as well. She should need the exact same to hit, which would be sevens. Unfortunately, she misses twice. <coughs> We'll go with uh, Blood Skull next. <laughs> She'll come to here. She'll move in and try to try to fist and tooth this thing. Now she's gonna need an eight, unfortunately. Oh, but she has plus one speed. That's beautiful. So she gets three dice. 
and she gets two hits. Fantastic. This is going very smoothly so far. In before trap card. <clears throat> All right. She has plus one strength, which means to wound, she's going to need fives. Gonna need fives. If I do this one, she gets attacked back if she fails. If I do this one, whether she fails or succeeds, the lion goes running off like a crazy person. So we're gonna do the beast temple first. And she needs fives. And she crits on a nine because Fist and Tooth has an inherent plus one luck. Crit! Beautiful. That's so good because. We've already gotten through the AI deck. So we reshuffle these and put them over here. So we ignore the reflex. The blow wallops the white lion's head, causing shockwaves of blinding pain. It's a persistent end injury. Whenever the white lion draws AI card, roll 1d10. If the result is 1 or 2, discard the card and end the monster's turn. That is fucking fantastic. Now, what will she do to the tail? Let's get another crit. Not another crit. In fact, it's not even a hit. Because she doesn't have the blind spot bonus. So, she misses. Wait, that's not an attack roll. That's a wound roll. That is a wound. <coughs> okay, so the good news is, she does another wound. One more AI card and one more final hit. So, two hits and the lion is dead. And so far, we're pretty unscathed. I should not say that, though, because any moment now, the lion's gonna go nuts and fucking enrage and... Well, no, we already know what's in his AI deck. He doesn't have enraged. See, we got lucky, like I was talking about. The dangerous cards that would have fucked us are, have already been removed before he ever had a chance to use them, like Chomp and Enraged and Terrifying Roar. <clears throat> so, we got lucky there, all across the board. She wounds him, but he gets a reflex, and a reflex happens whether you hit him or not. Full move monster forward in a straight line. Cancel all hits now out of range. Any survivors passed over suffer grab. So that's very rude. Fortunately, he's only going to pass over one person. So he's going to move all the way to the edge here, and then this character is supposed to be placed face down in front of him. But you can't go off the side of the board, so he's just placed off to the side. So he's knocked down. Not a huge deal, since he was already knocked down. But he also takes um, one damage to a random location. Which is his body. Alright, he's got a heavy wound. That would also knock him down, but he's already knocked down. If he gets hit in the body one more time, he has to roll on the death table. Wait, it doesn't go there, it goes here. It's not easy being green. No, it, no, it is not. Well, it's the green guy's turn, but he can't do anything. Because he's knocked down, and he can't get up yet. So, that makes it the lion's turn again. Well, we know he's going to size up. Ooh, that could be bad. Random threat in field of view. Okay, because he's knocked down, he is not considered a threat. A, a, to be a threat, a, mon a, a survivor must be standing, so it won't possibly affect him. It's going to be between one of these three. Field of view, by the way, has nothing to do with his facing. Field of view is anywhere on the board that he has line of sight to that's not blocked by an obstacle. Some do say facing, and that means it has to be ones that are actually in front of him. But, oh, preferred target token. That's true, Nox. Preferred target. You're right. So, this is going to go away at the start of his turn. So, Bone Grinder is automatically the target. Good call. I forgot about that. Um, so, he turns to face. It's okay. We're going to kill him on this next round, probably. And, um, roll a d10. And he does take a brain damage, but he can take it. He can take one, and he's knocked down. 
So he's going to lose his next turn as well. Both of these guys are now. Maybe we won't kill him this turn. We'll see. Oh, I think the ladies can do it. <coughs> okay. That was the lion's turn. It's our turn. Bone Tree and Bone Grinder can't do shit. What about range here? One, two, three, four. Well, she can get in front of it. She can't get... It should, we can't get it behind it at all because it's, its blind spot is off the board. I think our leader's going to go in, though, to this spot. And she's just going to attack. That doesn't give her any advantage, but... Yeah, new knockdowns do refresh the duration, Nox. So because he got knocked down again, he still can't get up until the end of the lion's next turn. That's why, that's why Encourage is a great action. Or like that ability that we had before from Fist and Tooth specialization where everybody could stand up at the start of the survivor or monster turn is a really great ability. Before you have that, you're constantly getting knocked down and losing turns. Um, right, so, she's gonna walk over there. She has no special bonuses to hit, so she's looking at eights, but she does get to roll thrice because of her extra speed. She got one eight. Oh, and it's the trap card! Clever ploy. The attacker is caught in the white lion's ruse. And is savagely mauled. Attacker is doomed. That means cannot spend survival. Form a basic action to target the attacker. Okay. Do, 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 do. She's about to get mauled. He rolls two dice, but he needs to roll fours to hit. She doesn't have evasion, right? No. <laughs> he needs to roll fours. And he gets two, two, it's two hits. So, Danger Will Robinson. Where does he hit her? Head and legs. Alright, nope. Oh, she's knocked down, because if you take a, one hit in the head, you get a heavy injury and you become knocked down. And then the hit location deck gets reshuffled. She is knocked down. And if she takes another hit in the head, it's fucking Danger Will Robinson time. Alright, who else can go? My gentlemen are too busy laying around. Ghost Skull's the only one who can do this. Come on, Ghost Skull. She is using Fist and Tooth, though, which is not the best. She has no special bonuses. She needs to roll eights. She only gets two dice. A perfect hit! Which doesn't trigger anything for her. It doesn't have any actual meaning. All it means is she hit. Be small. All right, well, if she fails to wound, it's going to be a bad day. If she succeeds to wound, some cool shit can happen. Though. Or if she criticals, I mean. Now, she's our luck master. She has plus one luck. Fist and Tooth inherently has plus one luck. What that means is she can crit on an eight or higher here. And she can wound on a... Ooh. On a six or higher. Six! Okay, she doesn't crit, but she does wound, which means he loses his final AI card. <coughs> At this point, the lion can do nothing but take its basic action every turn. And as soon as we hit it one more time, or wound it one more time, it is dead. So she did wound. And nothing else special happens, because she had to fail to wound to trigger that reaction. 
Okay. The lion's turn again. This could be dangerous. Well, we know it's going to... Closest survivor in field of view. Okay, they're all in field of view. There's three of them equal close. But I think it's going to go after the one that's, that's uh, standing up. And she has no evasion. So it needs to roll fours. Great! One of them's a miss because of those accuracy tokens. And one of them's a hit. I'm pretty sure she can take one hit. She'll be fine. In the legs? Yeah, she'll take that. We haven't even used any survival for dodges yet. Of course, again, we used our four fucking aws. Oh, she did use a survival, but not to dodge. She used it to gain a plus one strength. <clears throat> um... That's it. That's literally all the lion can do. So... I don't know why I'm trying a hit location. Okay, so now... They all stand up. Because the lion's turn just ended and none of them got knocked down on the lion's turn. <coughs> Alright, well let's finish this shit. Who wants to get the killing blow? Let's see if our leader can get the killing blow. Blood Skull, you got three swings. You need eights to hit. Ooh, two perfect hits. That'd be nice later in the game when you have stuff that triggers off that. Two perfect hits, no trap card, no whammies. All right. Um, we'll go for the beast ribs first. Wounds on a five, crits on a nine. Five, wound, game over. We win. We fucking win. It is dead, and our leader, Blood Skull has slain the white lion. Dun da da dun da 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 dun 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 Let's clean up the battlefield here. Wait, I think this is a deck <clears throat> of completely superfluous cards right here. Because I've got all the normal ones that the White Lion has. They celebrate their victory by tearing off their cloths, yes. Normally the White Lion is supposed to have... 12 and 9, I'm pretty sure. So I think I can just completely get rid of this, like, tutorial lion stack now. Because these are redundant with the ones in the basic decks. So, yep, those can go. We're going to move the lion over here next to the hunt board, because the next time we see the lion, it'll be over here. Move our characters down here out of the way. They have succeeded. Let's see what happens as a result. Showdown. Do 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 Explaining how to play, how to play, how to play, how to play. Okay. Survivors are victorious. Collect your rewards. By scavenging the monster's corpse, the survivors earn resources. This is in addition to any resources earned from critical wounds during the showdown. Which I don't think we did get any in that in that possible in that way. Wait a minute, bleed token. You just get over here and quit being bajigate. <clears throat>
We get four White Lion resource cards and four basic resource cards. And then we go to the settlement phase. Please one of these be a skull. It is a skull! Yes! There is only one skull in this entire deck. This is a 21 card deck and there's one skull in there. So the odds of getting one are pretty fucking low. Alright, we're off to a great start here. And then we got four of these. Now because of the way this is set up, I need to copy each of these. And then return this to the deck. We got his testes. That's good. That's fun. We got some white fur. But these I can just grab over here. Now I can just <coughs> delete these cards when used, or I can keep them without screw- because here's what would happen. Let's say I keep this Shimmering Mane, and I don't use it, right? And I'm holding it over here. We go to fight the next lion. If I hadn't copied this, then the next lion wouldn't have a Shimmering Mane. There just would be no chance to get a Shimmering Mane from the next lion, because there's only one card, and I've got it sitting over here. So that's why I have to copy the- the- <clears throat> Whereas I don't have to do that with the basic resources because this tabletop simulator mod for some reason automatically does that for me. But we got, okay, we got a hide which can be used to gain two hides if you don't want to use it for a specific purpose. Of course, we don't have the Katerium yet, so we can't make any White Lion stuff, specific stuff anyway. We got a lot of hide actually, which would normally be great. Because you could make a lot of rawhide leather armor for your guys. But we can't use leather armor. So all this hide is actually not so great for us. We're definitely going to use the skull. Actually, what we needed is a lot of bones. And we only got one. One, two, three, four hides. We got one bone. Well, this is a bone too, but we're clearly going to... Oh, when you gain this, a survivor of your choice gains plus one insanity. Alright, let's start building up the crazy leader. Also, we can heal and reset. Um, so this is what we got from our first, our first kill. At this point, we proceed to the settlement. After they defeat the White Lion, the survivors wander the darkness, drawn to a soft glow blooming on the horizon. Now we create the settlement that we'll return to in every settlement phase. We've got the settlement board, we're the returning survivors. <coughs> we name the settlement now, in which case everybody gets plus one survival for naming the settlement. Well, what will we name it?
Yeah, the Gear 1 event will happen at, right after we do the Returning Survivors event. <clears throat> um... I'm going to name our settlement Marrowhaven. So we now return to our settlement, or found our settlement, of Marrowhaven. Everybody gets one survival. And everybody, uh, these guys already all have one. See, we can't get another survival because right now our survival limit is one. So they, sh they all should have used their survival, really, because they're about to get it back right now. But that's okay. <clears throat> um, moving forward. <coughs> they heal any injuries. Yes, yes, yes. And we uh, gain endeavors. Now, right now, because we don't have anything special... All of us gain only one endeavor. At least we gain one each. Like, if you come back with fewer than four surviving people, you get even less. So we gain four endeavors, which are used to do things in this settlement. Settlement event, the first day. Find the first day settlement event card. Okay, so this is what happens first. And here it is, I've already pulled it out. The first day. The first day settlement event will help set up your settlement. It is the first event of any new campaign. The survivors wander, drawn to a blooming light in the distance. They find the serene comfort of a towering pile of lanterns and a small collection of scared people. On a deep, instinctual level, they know this area is safe, and they make it their home. Roll a d10 to determine your starting population. Choose and record genders for unnamed survivors. You can name them at any time. Alright. Rolling a d10. A 7. 7 plus, we get the max number. 10 unnamed survivors, plus the returning survivors. Update the death count. No one has died yet. This card will not be used again in the game. So, our population is 14. A decent starting population. No one has died yet. And... I could pull out a bunch of these survivor sheets just to have sitting around. <clears throat> but it doesn't really seem necessary. So I'm not going to. All right. Now we have to now we go to update the timeline. By the way, we're moving along this track right here. Now we update the timeline. This is when these events start happening. So we need to go to the story event called Returning Survivors. And we also check off the first year. So the story event... Returning... No, that's not it. Timeline events. Returning Survivors. There's the big stone face. Pretty cray. That is a creepy looking lantern edifice. Returning survivors, nominate a survivor to utter the first words. <coughs> well, our leader, Bloodskull, will utter the first words. 
The nominated survivor steps forward and gains plus one courage. They lead the other survivors to learn to speak to one another. They discuss their situation, realizing they must hunt to live. Add the white lion to the quarry list on the settlement record sheet. So she gets plus one courage. And now we can hunt the white lion. The settlement gains the language innovation. Language is your first innovation and will spark the creation of the innovation deck. The innovation deck represents the potential cultural and technological growth of your settlement. It will grow throughout the campaign as you gain new innovation cards. And I need to start my deck with those six cards. And I'm pretty sure I've already done that. Ammonia Drums, Hovel, Innerland, and Paint, and Symposium. So here's the language card. It does a couple cool things for us. <clears throat> it gives us plus one to our survival limit. And we have the encourage action now. So we can spend survival to help somebody stand up. And then we've got our deck. Which has... Drums, hovel, paint, inner lanterns, symposium, and ammonia in it. These are the these are the innovations we can possibly get. So our survival limit beautifully goes up to two. <clears throat> survival limit is very important. Finished with their work, the settlement gathers around its glowing center. Armed with language, the nominated survivor aptly names the glowing center of their home, the Lantern Horde. The settlement gains the Lantern Horde settlement location. It's the source of all innovations and further locations will develop. The nominated survivor sits in front of the Lantern Horde in awe and gains plus one understanding. So she's got plus one to courage and understanding now. But she must skip the next hunt phase. Skip next hunt. Which I hate, but I can live with it. And she ponders the meaning of existence. Alright. Now, after that happens, we would normally move forward on the timeline. Or on the settlement phase. And we go to the point of developing. <clears throat> but... But... Something else is going to happen first. Because I'm using the Gorm. Here's our Lantern Horde, by the way. It can be used to do some cool shit. We need... To do the event called... The Approaching Storm. Which means we need to go... To the Gorm... Book. It's the cover of the Gorm book. Looks pretty creepy. The Gorm travel enormous distances in their life cycles, shaping the landscapes with their enormous appetites and extreme bodily functions. Young Gorm roam the darkness, devouring anything that moves, and many things that don't. During their mating season, older Gorm produce storms of incredible destruction, Ancient Gorm that have lived hundreds of lantern years will make a final solitary march to the fabled, fabled Gorm Yards to die. The Gorm is a volatile quarry, but the complexities of its anatomy can unlock powerful tools for the settlement. Alright, so this is the Gorm rules, and here is a picture. That I don't know if this has anything to do with the Gorm, but there it is. And here's our event, the approaching storm. The settlement's weather takes a turn for the worse. A light appears on the horizon. <clears throat> From its origin, roiling masses of storm clouds approach the settlement, soaking everything in perpetual sheets of stale-smelling rain. Sudden flash floods, burning winds, and periods of strobing lightning continuously plague the settlement, leaving the survivors in epileptic fits. You may now hunt the Gorm. Add it to the quarry list. Add Glorm, Gorm Climate to the next Lantern Year on the timeline. <clears throat> Alright. So we can hunt the Gorm as well as the White Lion. And we're adding Gorm Climate to the next year. 
Nominate a survivor. They gain plus one insanity and brave the storm. Well, let's look at brave the storm and see whether it's going to screw us or not. Oh my god. We can already start getting blinded. Oh, I want 7, 8, 9, 10. Although that plus one permanent speed is no joke. Alright, well again, it has to be our leader, Blood Skull. She gains an insanity. <clears throat> and it's time to roll a d10. <coughs> a 10! Great! The resolute survivor stands strong in the face of the oncoming storm. Struggling against the mighty winds, she gathers the settlement together to build a shelter against the sickening storms. If they have not innovated it yet, the settlement gains the hovel innovation. And we all gain one, one survival. The great thing about that is we just got a free innovation. Normally, you can only get an innovation by innovating once per year, and it costs a bunch of stuff. So we just got one for free. Which is fantastic, because it also raises the survival limit. The settlement accepts this nightmarish landscape as their home. And it gives you an extra survival on departure, so we have one of those now. It's fucking fantastic. And we add the hovel consequences to the innovations deck. So what we need is to look through here for any ones that say hovel consequence, like bed. Partnership. Family. Okay, that's it. <coughs> so now these three go into our deck of ones that we can possibly learn. And we everybody gets plus one survival right now, which is glorious. takes us all up to two, except our limit is actually now three. Because of that hovel. Which is lovely. It's nice to get some good survival limit right out the gate. <coughs> Alright, cool. Um, <clears throat> surviving Storm is finished, right? That's something else next. Okay. So we've done with timeline events. So we move on to the next the next phase. Just looking to see if there's any special They also each have a hunt XP. That's a good question. <clears throat> they might not get one for the tutorial fight because it's so fucking easy. I'm not sure. Yes, they do get a hunt XP. Good call, Knox. Boop. 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 All right. So now we move on to the next step of the <coughs> Looking to see if there's any special rules here for the beginning. Uh, it's just telling you how to do. Okay. And then that's it. That's it for the first story. We're um, ready to go. All right, cool. So now we're on the best phase of the settlement, which is develop. 
We don't get to flip any of these over yet because certain events haven't happened yet. Once, when, once somebody dies, we get to decide our death principle. Once we have a baby born, we get to decide our life principle. And I don't remember what triggers this. And this, this doesn't happen until Lantern Year 12. <clears throat> um, innovations deck. Oh, this happens when you get like 15 population, I think. Innovations deck. So the first thing we're going to do every time when we come back, the first thing we're going to do is innovate. You can only do it once per settlement phase. It costs an endeavor. And a bone, an organ, and a hide. So we've got a hide right here. We've got an organ. And we've got a bone. So basically all of that stuff... <coughs> gonna get destroyed but now we get to draw from the innovations deck you get to draw two and choose the one that you want now well, partnership is crap I already know that we're not getting partnership so it's gonna be drums <laughs> drums lets you gain some insanity or survival or even remove a disorder from a survivor so it's not bad. Plus it adds drums consequences. Neither of those are very good. There's much better ones in here for the early game, but, you know, we'll take what we can get. <clears throat> drums. Get out of here with your drums. And we add drums consequences to the deck. Like a forbidden dance. Song of the Brave. Even the ones that you get from drums are not very good. But right, let's put him in the deck. Okay. That's our first endeavor spent. We have three more. Well, I can tell you what the first one's going to be. It's going to be the Ritual of the Skull. The settlement performs an exotic, violent dance with plenty of chanting. We have to spend our skull and spend an endeavor, but four people get an amazing, amazing stat boost. So Endeavor goes away, Skull goes away. Every one of our four people here gets a plus one to all of their attributes. Does that include movement? It says all. Hmm. Okay then. Oh my god, these characters are actually really strong right away. With that, with that boost, that's huge for the beginning part of the game. Of course, we're also going to be considerably weaker with such limited gear choices. So, I don't know. Maybe it'll balance out. Oh, we all have Encourage now as well. We can all encourage now as well. <clears throat> okay. She has to skip next hunt though, sadly. Alright, we cannot use cloth armor at all. We can't use it. Now, I don't know if there'll be some way later on to like... You know, break this down into some kind of material or like sell it or something. So I'm going to keep these. We can't wear them, but we're going to hold on to them. <clears throat> Alright, I've got two more endeavors to spend. Here are my options. Option one, I could play the drums. I don't think that's going to be what happens. Option two, <coughs> I could drink some water.
I could build a bone smith, I could build a skinnery, or I could build an organ grinder. Well, normally the skinnery is a really good thing, because you can make all this great armor, but look, here's a whole bunch of shit we can't use. So I don't care too much about the skinnery right now. Bonesmith is pretty obvious one, except we're not exactly full of bones here. We have one thing that can be used as a bone. Um, and what does the organ grinder give us exactly? Monster Grease is super good. Requires an organ. God, why do we have so much hide when we can't use it for anything, basically? Eco salve, dried acanthus. We don't have any acanthus. Monster tooth necklace. I mean, there's some nice stuff here, but we're not going to have the materials to make these and get the affinities that we need and everything yet. So I think it's pretty clear that we build a bone smith right out the gate. Oh, but an organ grinder lets us do augury. Hold on, let me check these milestones. What do I need? I need 15 people. So if we can get one baby born, I can hit that milestone. Alright, so I should build an organ grinder. Which costs one thingy. And now we get an organ grinder as our first thingy. Here's our organ grinder. You can make a bunch of stuff. It shows you what you need. And we can endeavor here <clears throat> to do an augury. Which can allow us to have intimacy and have a baby. So we're going to do that. Who's going to do the augury? Probably our leader. Yeah, it's going to be her. It's a seven. Which would just give us one survival, but if I spend one of my survival to adjust the roll up to an eight, we can do intimacy. Now, none of these four are actually going to do the intimacy, because they can fucking die. So, I'm going to use some normal scrubs here. I got 14 population, let me pull out a couple. One of them's male. One of them's female. We're gonna we're gonna make these two people have a kid. <coughs> and let's see what happens with them. So we go to the event known as intimacy. Apparently this is what our settlement looks like. Looks like a lovely place. Here's intimacy, isn't it nice? Isn't it sweet? Nothing could go wrong here. All right, nominate one consenting male and one consenting female survivor. Oh, they're consenting. Yeah, they are, because I say they are. All on the intimacy table below. All right. Let's roll this. I believe that Bone Tree will preside over this intimacy. Hashtag bonding over bones. A what? Fuck! Well. He's gonna, he's gonna partially mitigate the disaster by spending one point of survival. And that makes it a two. The female survivor perishes with her child during birth. The settlement is cast in gloom. The male survivor mourns, gaining a random disorder and plus three insanity. <coughs> so instead of gaining population, we just lost population. We have our first death. 
and this fine lady goes away. But this guy is a little bit cray. Because of it. He's, he's gotten a little bit cray. Well, that was a waste. But something does happen because we just had our first death. So we go to principal death. Principal death. No, that's not what I want. <clears throat> Okay, so here's a lovely image. Well, it's pretty much going to show what uh, what Marrowhaven is all about. Because I'm going to choose all of the evil principles this time since I chose all the good ones last time. So we pretty much are going to be eating motherfuckers. You know that lady that just died in childbirth? She's on the menu. Principle death. The group must decide what to do with their first survivor corpse. Choose one. <laughs> the first harvest. The settlement decides to harvest the body for resources, or the first grave. The settlement decides to build a small monument to mark their la loss. Yeah, Marrowhaven is the Chapel of Lights. Alright, well, last time I did the first grave, um, but this time... This time, we're going to... Go nuts with some first harvest. So, first we gain the death principle cannibalize. Death principle cannibalize. Survival limit plus one. Whenever a survivor dies, draw a basic resource and add it to the settlement storage. The cool thing about that is a survivor did just die. So, this could hypothetically be a fucking skull, which would be amazing. It's not. Oh, it's a love juice, though. That's actually fantastic. Because we can use love juice to create an automatic intimacy. Good, good, good. That'll help make up for the fact that we just lost a person. And our survival limit goes up to a m wonderful four. I mean, we don't have any gear or stuff that will help us get up to that four yet. But still pretty good. Glorious. It's ironic since intimacy made the love juice. Yeah. I know, right? Like, I don't even want to think about all the fucking mechanics of what went on here. <laughs> <coughs> and we roll a d10. Bone grinder will preside over this roll. With a three. Damn, I really wanted that 6 to 10. But I didn't get it, because I can modify it up to a 5, but... Did the male survivor get his random disorder? Oh, no. Let's see what he gets. Vestophobia. You cannot wear armor at the body location. What body location? Even the lightest armor rubs harshly against your skin and constricts your ability to move. <clears throat> if you're wearing armor at the body location when you gain this disorder, archive it as you tear it off your person. I guess... Oh, that could be really beneficial when it comes to killing the king's man. Because this phobia, this... Um, disorder could save you from the king man's curse because you would never be able to have his complete set which means you'd never turn into a king's man Vestophobia. I guess I have to randomly roll a location because it's acting like there's a location that's specific here in the head. He can never wear head armor, which isn't really the best, because head is one of the few locations we can actually get bone armor for. But, um... We put Vestophobia on here as a disorder.
That's fine. Um, Alright, so what does happen here? Sadly, we didn't get that 6, because that plus 1 permanent speed would have been fucking amazing. The rich settlement ritualistically divides the corpse with a sharp stone and grimly consumes the dead flesh. Gain a founding stone. Fuck you, that's useless to us. And all departing survivors gain plus 3 insanity. Okay. Well, she's not going to get that because she can't depart this time because she has to skip next hunt. But he's going to get it. He's going to get it. He's going to get it. She's going to get it. Okay, well that's what happens when somebody dies. Now, let's go back to intimacy. Because... <coughs> we have a love juice. And we're going to use it right now. <coughs> to try to get some more intimacy going. Alright. Ghost Skull. Preside over this intimacy. An eight. That's much better. <clears throat> we don't have a bed, so the survivor does not gain extra strength. The settlement gains plus one population. The male and female survivors share a deep bond and gain plus ten survival each. Wow. Well, this guy's going to be the dad again. Oh, he can't have ten. You can only go up to the maximum. <clears throat> this guy's going to be the dad again, and we need to create a new mom. And we've actually had a baby! Takes us up to a 14 population. <clears throat> Which means we just triggered something else. Principal, new life. Our first child has been born. There we go, kid. What do you choose? The sword or the ball? Group must decide how to raise their young. We've got two choices. Without mercy, the toys are taken from the child and replaced with a cold stone face shard. Training begins immediately. <coughs> Settlement gains the new life principle survival of the fittest. Or with affection. The settlement embraces the child with warm arms. Nurturing new life is their highest calling. Settlement gains the new life principle, protect the young. Okay, this is what we got last time. Last time we got protect the young with affection. This time, though, fuck a bunch of that. We're going without mercy. Survival of the fittest. More survival limit, holy fuck. When rolling on the intimacy story event, roll twice and pick the lowest result. That's fucking awful. But all newborn survivors gain plus one strength. That's really not as good. The other one's a lot better. It lets you just roll twice on intimacy and pick whichever pick pick whichever one you want. Of course it doesn't raise your survival limit. <clears throat> more survival limit's going to be good once we can get a way to increase our survival more. A lot of survival limit. For the fucking first year of the game? 
A survival limit of five seems extremely high to me. Um. All right, now we have to roll a d10. So let's roll that d10. A two. The settlement ce celebrates with a rowdy party, filled with tests of strength and triumphant roaring. The parents each gain plus one permanent strength and plus two insanity. And they've got to skip the next... Oh, I was going to bring this guy on the next hunt, but that's okay. Plus one strength, plus two insanity. Oh, quite a couple we have here. <clears throat> Alright, so that's our... Our first additional characters. Neither of them can go on the hunt this time. So I'm going to need to pull out another rando to replace Blood Skull on this hunt. Alright, cool. I think everything that can happen in our settlement phase has now happened. I don't think we can do a single other thing. We're out of endeavors. I guess hypothetically we could build something. We could make a monster grease. Monster grease is quite nice. We could use this thing as an organ. Oh, dude, I didn't make any fucking weapons, though. Oh, we did get a survivor of founding stone. I mean, I don't know that it'll ever do us any good. To have this in our in our inventory, but we can never equip it, but maybe we can somehow trade it or something with in some event. I don't know. <clears throat> um Yeah, nothing else can happen unless we want to... Let's do it. Let's make a monster breeze because it could, it could save our lives here. Organ grinder gear. And of course, we're going to put it on Bone Tree, raising his evasion to a three, which is fucking good. <clears throat> All right. I think that's going to conclude our first lantern year. Nothing else can happen here. So as we prepare to leave, so we go through this development phase. We prepare the departing survivors. Everybody's going to get one survival. Could have done drums. So that's one for you. One for you. I need one of those first aid kits ASAP. How do I get one of those first aid kits? I think it's the stone circle. Nope, it's not. Oh, it's the barber surgeon, which I can't get until I get a certain thing. So I might not get a, bar a barber surgeon for a long time. <clears throat> oh, we need some dried acanthus. That'll give us two survival when departing. But that means we need to get some acanthus. Which is hard to get because you have to randomly pull it from the terrain card. I'm just thinking, most of the items that give you plus survival on Depart are fucking leather items that aren't bone. Um, yeah, well there's nothing else we can do right now. So, 
The core and archive resources, yeah. Alright, and the settlement phase. So we go back to the beginning. <clears throat> and now we'll have to do an actual hunt phase. Now right now we could hunt a white lion or a gorm. I could just try going for a gorm right out the gate and hope for the best. Maybe I shouldn't though, since we're not going to have her. Oh yeah, I have to prepare. I have to... Oh, she's not a departing survival. She doesn't get this point of survival. Alright, we're going to move Blood Skull over here. And I'm going to have to make another rando. To replace her. So what's her name going to be? is going to be Laughing Skull. <clears throat> and she's got us to have a limit of five. She gets one for being named. She gets one for departing right now. We can encourage. She gets a plus one to something of her choice. We'll take speed. The laughing skull. I can't believe we don't have any gear. We don't have any fucking weapons, Nox. We're all going fist and tooth. <laughs> this is gonna be terrible. What have I done? I just didn't get enough bones, man. Just didn't get enough bones. Also, plus three insanity due to that one event. Yeah. Oh, man. Nox, you're on the motherfucker. You are on the motherfucker. Dude, this is gonna be bad, man. We're gonna get rolled. We have no weapons. All we can use is shitty fist and tooth, and we don't have a fighting art which makes fist and tooth better, like my other character had. And we don't have any armor at all. And we don't even have like that much survival. I mean, if we if we were maxed on survival, it would be good, but we're not. <laughs> this is this is going to be ago. Going to be ago. All right, I'm not going after a gorm for my very first hunt. I'll do one level 1 white lion first. Then I'll do a gorm in the year after that. Okay. Let's um let's save the game because we've completed a lantern year and that will be where this episode ends, but I'm not going to quit streaming. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to start my next episode. <clears throat> so if you're watching on Twitch, don't go anywhere because I'm not going anywhere either. If you're watching on YouTube, that is going to do it for this episode. So thank you for watching. This has been Josiah Plays Kingdom Death Monster.